Good morning, everybody. Got a quick question for you. Have you ever had something that just seemed too big that you didn't even want to pray for it? You didn't want those words to come out of your mouth because you knew at that point you were committed. Well, that's kind of what we're going to go through today. Uh, like I said, we're in our Joshua series. This is part eight of it. Uh, the sermon is entitled, Sun Stand, Stand Still. Now we're going to do a quick review of our story of Joshua. As you guys know, uh, Joshua was one of the spies that was sent into the promised land. He came back and he had a good report. Said, yeah, we need, we need to move into this promised land. But 10 of the other spies convinced the people not to. So for 40 years they wandered. Joshua became Moses' right-hand man. Anytime Moses did something, Joshua was right there with him to help him out. When Joshua, or excuse me, when Moses died, Joshua was put in charge of the Hebrews. And he was given a plan to take over the promised land. And so Joshua put this plan in motion. And he had a lot of success because the Lord was on his side. During the success, you know, a few weeks ago we heard about Jericho. They marched around the city for seven days. Didn't do anything, didn't attack, didn't do anything. Seven days marched around the city. And on the seventh day, they screamed, shouted, blew their horns, and the walls came down. Well, now after that, they moved on to the city of Ai, which was a larger city, and they took it. Well, the next city that they were to take was the city of the Gibeonites. Well, the Gibeonites didn't want to fight them. They, they saw that the Lord was with Joshua. So the Gibeonites decided to trick them. They put on old tattered clothes. They brought old moldy bread. And they came and they made a treaty. They tricked Joshua into a treaty. Now, I don't know about you guys. I would have been pretty upset to get tricked like this. Kind of like a switch and bait on a used car sale. So there were five Amorite kings. And they heard about the Gibeonites, now allies with Joshua. And this concerned them. They were scared. So they said, hey, let's come together and let's attack the Gibeonites. Well, they did. The Gibeonites sent a message to Joshua and said, hey, we're allies with you now. Come save us. So Joshua, being a good man, a man of his word, gathered up all of his troops, and they marched all night long to go and fight against the Amorite kings. <coughs> Pardon me. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so that's kind of where our story starts today at the battle when they fought the Amorite kings. Our scripture today comes from Joshua 10, 12 through 13. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun stand still over Gibeon, and you moon over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Jasher, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky, and delayed going down a full day. Now that the first thing that, that strikes us here in verse 12 is Joshua prayed in front of all of Israel. Now he didn't hide over in the corner and they got a No, he stood up in front of everybody. He stood up in front of the whole nation that he's leading and asked for the sun to stand still, asked for the moon to stand still. That's, that's an impossibility. But because he stood up in front of all of Israel, he was setting an example and letting his light shine. How often do we not pray a big prayer because it's impossible? We're unable to achieve it. Well, absolutely we're unable to achieve it. You know, I'm guilty of this. I get a great idea in my head. And it's a great idea for about 30 seconds until I start considering all the work that goes into it. <laughs> and, you know, Lord, it's just too much for me. It is just too much for me. Absolutely, it is too much for me. But you know what? It's not too much for our God. You know, 
Let's go to the next slide. God answers every prayer that we put out there. Every prayer that has ever been prayed is heard and answered. Now, God's answer sometimes is yes, sometimes it's no, and sometimes it's just not yet. Maybe the timing is not quite right. But every prayer that we ask is answered. Now, sometimes we hear what we want to hear. Other times we don't. But it doesn't mean that God doesn't know what's best for us. He knows what is best for us in that time. You know, as humans, if I get what I ask for, if I ask, Lord, give me this new job, and I get that, we say, the Lord answered my prayers. But if I don't get that job, oh, the Lord didn't answer my prayers. We've got to remember, he did answer my prayer. Maybe that wasn't the job for me, or maybe it just wasn't the time. So he does answer every prayer. Next slide. We need to let our light shine. And when we're out in public, people are looking at us. We need to, when we're at a restaurant, bow our heads. Give thanks for that meal that the Lord has provided for us right there. Because your light is shining then to everybody around you. Not just the people at your table. Everybody around you sees that. It has an effect. When we see someone hurting out in public, and we take a minute to pray for that person, that lets the light shine in their life. I want to stop right here for a minute. This is not in my notes, but when someone stops you in a grocery store, and tells you of a trouble they're having, or you're talking to a friend, and they say, hey, pray for me. Don't tell them, okay, I will, because you won't. You'll forget about it. Stop right that second. Stand right there in that grocery store and hold their hands, right there at that gas station. Hold their hands and pray for them. Amen. It will do miraculous things in their life. It will do miraculous things in your life, but it will affect the people around you, that light will radiate out from you. You will be affecting people you don't even realize. You know, every decision we make, we need to make sure that we're in prayer on it. Not just the big ones. Not just the ones that are too big for me to fix or too big for me to figure out. We need to make sure we have the Lord involved in every last one of them. We need to each pray in the presence of our own personal Israel. You know, Joshua stood up in front of all of his peers, the people he were leading, and prayed. And that's what we've got to do. You know, your personal Israel may be your family, your friends, your coworkers, but we've got to be bold enough to do that. Next slide, please. Be audacious in your prayers. Verse 12, Joshua said to the Lord, in the presence of Israel, sun stand still over Gideon and moon over the valley of Ajalon. Now the word audacious, what exactly does that mean? You know, I, I thought I knew it. It's something that's, that's you know, bold and forceful. But the, the actual definition is showing a willingness to take a surprisingly bold risk. Well, that's what we have to do. We have to take that bold risk. That's what Joshua did by putting out there, asking for the sun and the moon to stand still. You know, when he did this, he asked for the rhythm of the universe to change. Because the sun is the center of our universe. The earth rotates around it. The moon rotates around the earth. So for these things to stop, it sent a ripple throughout everything. So this was a, a, a major thing he was asking for here. Let's go to our next slide, please. Now, how did this actually happen? Scientists have spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. They've calculated the position of the sun, the position of the earth, the position of the moon the position of Israel on the planet. 
And they actually have come up with a date, which kind of surprised me. Uh, they came up with October uh, 30th, 1207 BC. So now our modern world likes to explain everything away. Anything that we say is a miracle today, modern world wants to try to explain it away. You know, they've come up with theories of, well, the Earth's rotation was a little slower that day, so it seemed like they had a longer day. They've come up with, well, the sun was just at this right position, and it reflected off the clouds, kind of like a mirror, and that's why they had a longer day. I don't know. You know, I, I'm a very simple person. I don't know how it happened. It could have happened one of these ways. It could have happened some other way. The thing that I do know is that the Bible tells me that God, the creator of everything in our world, the God that made my hand that'll open and close like that, that makes corn sprout up from a little seed, a fish can breathe underwater, a child is formed in the womb's mother, stopped the earth that day so that Joshua could defeat his enemies. And a lot of times that's all we have to take is what our Bible tells us. We don't have to explain it away. Next slide. And be realistic. Now I know, I know when Joshua stood out there in front of all his peers and asked for the sun and the moon to stand still, I know somebody said, are you kidding? Who does he think he is? Be realistic, man. Come on, amp it down a little bit. That's, that's crazy. But you know what? Joshua had faith. He knew what the Lord could do. The next slide, please. You know, when Moses left out of Egypt, he didn't know how he was going to provide for the Hebrews. He didn't know how he was going to food, water, shelter, protection. He didn't know how he was going to do it. But he had faith, and he prayed an ambitious prayer. When Pastor Heath, or excuse me, Pastor Herb, walked out into a field here in Winnemac, Indiana, and said, you know what, we're building a church right here. I guarantee you, and it may have been some of you guys that said, are you crazy? You know, I know the community probably said it. You got no money. You don't own the land. You got no plan. But yet, Pastor Herb had faith, and he prayed an audacious prayer. He believed in what the Lord was going to do. How often are we frozen by the idea of something that's too big for us? At times, it will paralyze you right in your tracks, stop you from doing what the Lord has called you to do. You know, often we sit back and we look at the size of the problem instead of looking at the size of our God. You know, and I'm guilty of this. I mean, I'll be honest with you guys, you know, like I said earlier. I see a problem or I see a, an idea, and it's a great idea for about 30 seconds till I realize the amount of work that I have to put in or, or the things that are impossibilities. That's the first thing we list is the impossibilities. And I forget about the size of my God, and I concentrate on the size of the problem. We've got to change that. Next slide, please. Now, I recently read a quote from a fella named Stephen Furtick, and I'm going to read it. I want to make sure I get it word for word, because it really, when I first read it, I thought, well, that's really neat. That, that's a good quote. If the size of your vision for your life isn't intimidating to you, there's a good chance it's insulting to God. And I was like, you know, that, that's, a, that's a good but then I read it again. If the size of your vision for your life isn't intimidating for you, there's a good chance it's insulting God. 
And it really pierced my heart then because I realized then I'm not looking at the size of my God. I'm looking at the size of this problem. And shame on me. I don't want to do anything that's insulting to God. If he gives me a vision, he will equip me to see it through. I want to tell you guys a quick personal story here. Uh, when I moved to northern Indiana, I worked for the airlines. And uh, Dawn and I had a home in South Bend. And after about 10 years, they decided to close the hangar there. But they offered me a job down in Memphis, Tennessee, which is my home. So we were, we were glad for that. So we had a plan. Dawn would stay up here, pack up the house, put it on the market, get it sold, come down to Tennessee, and we would... We would get a new home down there. Well, this went on for two and a half years. Two and a half years, I lived in Memphis, and she lived up here. I would come home roughly every other weekend. She took care of everything here at the house. Wintertime, she made sure that the snow was removed. Any problem, we had a, <laughs> we put in brand new carpet, and the next day, the hot water heater exploded and ruined the brand new car, but she dealt with that. We were overwhelmed. We got one offer in two and a half years on our house, and it was just a ridiculously low offer. We were at our ends. That was our impossibility right then. Lord, why aren't we together? We want to be together, and we prayed. I came home one weekend on a motorcycle ride, a friend of mine told me, hey, you know, the railroad over here is hiring people. So I took a chance and applied, and here we are. We're still here. We still have our home in South Bend. We're here with you guys. So the Lord answered that prayer. Amen. Now, when we were asking for the Lord to sell our house, and he told us no, it wasn't the end of it this wasn't our time. Maybe someday our house will sell. We're not trying to sell now. But the thing is, we had to pray that prayer. What seemed impossible to us. And the Lord answered that. Next slide, please. Now, what is your impossible prayer? You know, it's different for every person. You know, maybe your impossible prayer is not to stop the sun and the moon in the sky. Maybe your impossible prayer today is to get up tomorrow morning and go to that job and work those long hours. Maybe your impossible prayer is to witness to that difficult person that you know. Maybe it's a relative, maybe it's a coworker. I'll be honest with you, personally, I've known people that I thought it was going to be impossible to witness to them. Maybe that's your impossible prayer for today. Maybe it's to go on a mission trip. Maybe, you know, I'm too old. I don't have the money. I don't have the time. If the Lord puts that on your heart, you pray that prayer. And I will say this as a little sidebar on mission trips. If you go on a mission trip, it will change your life forever. You will not come back the same person. I will guarantee you that. You know, maybe maybe God's put on your heart to do something with the homeless or start a food pantry. I don't know. It's different for each and every one of us. But you've got to pray that audacious prayer. You've got to pray for that impossibility. Now, our application slide for today is dare to pray that impossible, audacious prayer. When you pray that prayer, you're showing your faith and your trust in our God, the God that created everything, the God that is nothing is impossible for him. Our next point, believe in God for the impossible. You know, Pastor Herb, believe 
that this church was going to be here. And here we are today. When Moses led those Israelites out, he knew the Lord was going to provide for them. He believed. So we've got to believe God for the impossible. I'd like to go ahead and close in prayer right now. If you guys would, bow your head. Close your eyes.